Hey everyone, it's the Kung Fu Genius, aka Alex Richter. If you're listening to us on audio only, I'd appreciate you reviewing and rating the podcast wherever you listen to it. And if you're watching us on YouTube, of course, if you like what I do here, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius and hit that bell for notifications. I have an announcement for Kung Fu Genius fans. Right now, for a limited time, you can get a one-month all-access trial subscription to Wing Chun Illustrated Magazine absolutely free. No strings attached after that free month either. Go to wcinewsstand.com to register in the upper right corner. Fill in your email and password and use the code KFGTRIAL to get one month free access to all the issues published from 2011 to the current issue. How cool is that? All the issues. And if you want that information again, it's in the description below. And with that, let's get started. All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will continue discussing the secretly recorded Bruce Lee phone conversation from episode one. Lots of insight, lots of context, lots of Bruce Lee. Let's get to it. He is unstoppable, unbeatable, unbelievable. He's Alex Richter, the Kung Fu genius. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Watch out. Word is, I'm a Kung Fu genius. Practiced all day like a genius. <laughs> All right, Dre, man, how you doing? I'm good, Sifu. Let's do it. Let's yeah. do it. So uh, that intro took a little bit of time. I thought you'd be getting a little bit better at that. But you know you what seem... it is? It's just, you know, <laughs> you never let me practice it beforehand. So. Well, that's part. I, I think that's part of the charm because yeah. I thought as a goof, we would just put your outtakes in the end of like episode one and it would be kind of funny and then after that you wouldn't need to make those mistakes anymore but it would make sense right yeah it's become basically a tradition and i think that if i didn't put those outtakes at the end of the episode uh people would get (laughs) upset because you know people want to see how how long did it take this time i'm glad on my behalf yes you know we can all have some entertainment some entertainment although i have to admit i mean the number of outtakes i edit it's just a very very small selection from how long (laughs) it takes you'd actually do it those are just the best of the worst best of the worst so so yeah so for the best so for today i want to continue basically what we talked about in episode one because uh episode one we started to listen to that uh, secretly recorded phone conversation uh, between bruce lee and his student daniel lee and you know we only got through like the first two minutes Couple of that of gold nuggets yeah yeah but that because that, that whole first part was about you know the white crane tai chi fight which we discussed on that episode and also on the history of the uh, tournaments episode yes. so we kind of like I think we kind of we kind of squeeze that lemon pretty pr- pretty thoroughly and so now it's time to talk about the rest of the conversation because a lot of um, a lot of our listeners were like hey well, wh- where's part two and it's like oh, we haven't we haven't done it yet Oops, so um, almost forgot part two yeah. that's right uh, knowing how we do it you know we can never tell how many <laughs> episodes it's going to take to go through the whole conversation because um, there's a lot of stuff when it comes to Bruce Lee there's always a lot of stuff to unpack when he's you know when he's talking about you know whatever even whether he's just talking about the movies or the martial arts stuff there's always so much to unpack so I'm looking forward to talking about this uh, next part of the conversation I don't know how much of it we're going to get through I think the uh, original or at least the edited version of this phone conversation is clocking in it's either I think it's around 20 minutes altogether. But we got through two, the first we got crucial through, two yeah. minutes. Okay. A one, uh, in a one-hour episode, we we managed to get through two minutes of Bruce Lee's conversation. So if, <laughs> right. if that passes any so uh, indicator, we we're going to... It's, it's going to be a number of episodes before we get through this. But at least nice. that means we have plenty of content. Yes. So um, I, I talked a little bit about what I knew about the context of this conversation in mm. the first episode. But I've actually since uh, talked to some people... I'm not going to mention who they are. They might even be future guests on the Kung Fu Genius podcast. Okay. But I actually talked to some people who know experts a little bit. on this conversation. Well, let's just say Bruce Lee experts in general. Okay. And they had some knowledge of, of this phone hops. conversation. Oh, oh, the okay. full knowledge of the hip-hop. Full knowledge, yeah. And also of this phone conversation. So apparently, uh, as I alluded to before, Bruce Lee did not know he was being recorded. And uh, uh, Daniel Lee, apparently, um, he worked perhaps, this is what I heard, I may be wrong about it, like as an engineer or he'd done some kind of engineering work and he had a some kind of tape recorder with him regularly, right? That was one of my questions. Yeah. How, I mean, this is 70. 72, yeah. 70? Yeah. Okay, now, what is he into? 
what is he? So from what I heard, he like had a CIA some CIA guy or something. He, yeah, exactly. Right. Because, uh, you know, it was all, like in a James Bond movie, they right. would have this kind of technology, yeah. you know, in, in that time. And it would be a really big deal. Like yeah. half the half the Bond gadgets from those old James Bond <laughs> movies. You have better stuff on your phone now. Right. I've been watching those old Bond movies and it's like, you know, a tracking device. Yeah. It's like and, he, we, and Bruce Lee never knew. You never hear like a click or anything like yeah. that. So, so so Daniel Lee had had, had access to some you, perhaps state of the art equipment for that time. Right. And he recorded Bruce Lee his Sifu during this conversation and apparently Bruce Lee did not know he was being recorded, which um of course <clears throat> technically makes the recording illegal uh and, and you know uh but say what you want i i i've mentioned before i think this is actually one of my favorite pieces of bruce lee mm. media because this is bruce lee unfiltered yeah. he doesn't he's not kind of playing it up for the media he's not you know trying True to blue. sound cool for yeah. pierre burton or anything like that this is just <laughs> him being bruce lee cool. and and you get an impression of what he's like because, you know, the way people are in front of a camera when there's an audience there is always quite a bit different from how they are when the cameras are off. And this is one of the few chances kinda we like have. Us. Yeah, kind of <laughs> like us. Right? Although there's no difference between us in the real world and on oh, the no. podcast. This is as unfiltered as it, uh, unfiltered <laughs> as it gets, right? So anyway, uh, he, he's recorded. Now, there was some speculation that Bruce Lee later found out that he was recorded by his student and how he was not he happy about out? it. Well, I don't know, but mm. I've been told I have a, the great thing about doing a podcast like this, especially being in the martial arts world and having a lot of the friends that I have is I'll do a podcast like this. And afterwards, people send me a message like, hey, you know, actually, da, 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 da. and right. then and then they'll give me some little nugget or whatever. And I'll be like, oh, damn it. I could have I could have used that information before I recorded the podcast. Nice. Right. It's like after it's like, yeah. oh, great. So I think that's why it's always good for us to do a multi-part series because we'll find out the first part mm -hmm. we were like mostly wrong about what we were talking about. Yes, yes. And then by, we can correct it by the second and third part of that same topic, okay. right? So anyway, uh, what I heard was from one source that Bruce Lee found out he was recorded and he was none too pleased, as you can imagine. And I said, well, regardless, like I don't, I think people would even if they didn't put their foot in their mouth, would still feel somewhat betrayed if they found out that they were recorded and they didn't know it. Even mm. if they ended up not saying anything, you know, controversial or bad or whatever, I think it's just kind of a bit of a trust issue that someone did that to you and you didn't know about it, mm. right? However, I recently was contacted by another, let's say, high-level Bruce Lee expert, okay? And he told me that, Bruce Lee never found out that he was recorded. Yes, he was secretly recorded, but he never found out about it because, and you know, perhaps in some future episode, I'll talk about who, who uh, told me this. Okay. Um, because the first time this phone conversation was revealed was at Bruce Lee's funeral. So there, wow. that, would, that would mean, at least in theory, Bruce Lee could not have heard it, right? Whoa. And this is in front of everybody at the funeral? Well, I don't know that. So all, all I know is that the uh, Daniel Lee um, brought this conversation or brought this recording with him to the funeral. And I mean, I don't maybe think... Maybe he played I, it for the immediate family. Yeah, and maybe it's maybe on the side or maybe maybe after yeah. after okay. the whole ceremony. So, I mean, it's not like, you know, they're bringing out Bruce like, Lee's casket imagine, and he's going, hey guys, listen yeah, to this, right? I can't imagine doing a, him doing a eulogy and be like, okay, check this out, what I've recorded. Yeah. Right, exactly. Like, you know, be, because of course, uh, Daniel Lee is Chinese and he understands respect and stuff. So mm -hmm. this is not to make it seem like he was coming, trying to, you know, put himself <laughs> front and center. I'm pretty sure... When he, you know, people, you know, obviously were devastated by the loss of Bruce Lee and to hear his voice and to hear him talk mm. was probably would probably be a welcome thing at that point. So we can imagine that there was actually a very positive intent with okay. this. And also think about it up until that point, he had no reason to kind of play it or show it to anyone anyway. So that's just what I heard. So that is not I'm not trying to, like, say anything good, bad mm. or whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure Daniel Lee is a um, as, as someone of Chinese heritage knows how to, you know, how to be respectful during his Sifu's funeral or whatever. Okay. Not like um, <clears throat> the famous Kung Fu movie star who did, who only had a couple hits. Uh, do you ever hear uh, Conan Lee? Conan Lee was in a movie Ninja in the Dragon's Den. And what? he's actually in a... Uh, um, I've never heard it, of Conan Lee. Yeah, he, he grew up here in the States. And then okay. he had the chance to uh, make this movie uh, called Ninja in the Dragon's Den. And they were kind of trying to bill him as like the next coming of Jackie Chan. But he had just such a massive ego. He ended uh. putting putting off everyone because it wasn't like the Chinese actors who kind of, you know, they understand that the director, you got to listen to him even if you don't like him and so on. Like he came with 
no films under his belt and decided he was going to act like, you know, some late actor in the late stage of his career who's highly established. Mm. And he basically ruined his ability to continue working other in Hong Kong. we heard about. Yeah. 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 And he, he later came back into, I think, T Tiger on Beat Cody or Tiger Lee. on Beat 2. Yeah. But he was just such a diva to work with that he basically he basically nuked his own career. And oh. uh, at the funeral, there was a, a funeral, let's just say, I'm not going to say who, but let's say in the last 10 years of a very well-respected Hong Kong director, okay, who is just very well-known. Well, Conan Lee shows up and, you know, is taking selfies with the other movie stars at the funeral in the funeral home. And it's kind of like... Mm. So I'm not at all trying to equate Daniel Lee unveiling this Bruce Lee recording with something like Conan Lee showing up Got at this director's okay. uh, uh, funeral and going like, hey, yeah. you know, famous Kung Fu me. movie star, let's uh -huh. take a selfie, right? Okay. We're not talking about that at all, right? Wow. Uh, so uh, I, I thought that was interesting. So I, you know, perhaps this expert who gave me this information, maybe uh, we'll have him on a future episode and we can talk to him about this. So, you okay. know, but, but so I basically found out, I don't think... Bruce Lee found out that he was recorded because this was recorded very late in Bruce Lee's life. And there would be no way I, I think this that Daniel Lee would just be playing it for everyone and then find somehow get found out. Also, uh, it makes me wonder about their relationship. Mm -hmm. Daniel Lee was not one of those like, you know, I, I'm taking it that Daniel Lee was a more closer student mm -hmm. and, and, and being able to like uh, just call him up and say, right. hey, hey, Sifu. Yeah. This is what's going on. Let's sure. talk about this. Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, As you, you, raise, to, yeah. you raise a good point. But again, like I said in the first episode, I, I'm not like the expert on right. the personal relationship between Bruce Lee and all of his students. Mm -hmm. uh, that's always a very complicated thing. And normally that's always told after the fact, you know, usually by the student themselves. So it's very difficult to get an accurate assessment. I mean, the yeah. fact that Bruce Lee was having a phone conversation with Daniel Lee and was being very open with him definitely implies that there's exactly. uh, some kind of closeness, right? Right. Um, but I'm, I'm not one to speculate in terms of like how that may have been different from Bruce Lee's relationship with any of his other students at that time. Maybe Bruce was like that to a handful of his students and not mm. just to one. Obviously, Daniel Lee is Chinese. And from what I understand, Bruce had um, a you know special relationship with, with his Chinese students, of which he didn't have very many. But you know, for example, Ted Wong, students that he could also speak some Cantonese with, I think had kind of yeah. a kind of a special place because you can imagine that he, he can communicate certain ideas to them from right. a point of cultural understanding that is maybe difficult so for him to... Cool phrases too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So... Um, so anyway, that that just adds a little bit more context to this conversation, right? So we listened to the first two two minutes or so, which is which was all about that uh, Tai Chi versus White Crane fight, or at least that's my speculation that it was about that. And uh, so now let's continue the phone conversation and let's kind of get into what goes okay. on there. So I'm going to pull it up. I, I should have queued it up to where we left off. So <laughs> I thought you did that already. Yeah, let's go ahead and listen to it. Okay. Uh, the level is too slow. What I'm hoping to do in film is to be just that, to raise the level. Uh, There's a real mission there. Really? Yeah, really. I mean, actually, not only raise the level, actually upgrade that's the right, respect from the Western well, world. Well, that's what I'm, that's what I hope to do, man. Yeah. Because, uh, like here, I mean, you know, I'm the reason I'm coming back is Warner Brothers wants me to do a television series. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I'll do it now. Yeah. I'm going to concentrate, you know, in Hong Kong and, uh, So, all right, that's, that's already quite interesting right there, right? Mm -hmm. So he says a couple things that are really, um, in my opinion, there's a little bit to unpack there. One, he talks about raising the level. Mm -hmm. And he mentions about kind of taking some of that idea from the Western world. Because you have to realize that by the time Bruce Lee came to um, Hong Kong to start making those films, not only was he a childhood actor who had already worked in Hong Kong and had kind of an understanding of what that industry was like, but he had already worked in Hollywood on a number of projects. So not just Green Hornet, but he had also done Marlowe, which was a feature yeah. film. He had also done uh, pretty big TV stuff, um, Ironsides. And I think that he, yeah, he already did the uh, episode of Long Street at this point. So he understood like kind of the Western way that things were shot there. And also he understood a little bit about camera angles and things that were different from what the Chinese were doing. And yes. so he wanted to kind of fuse those things together. And film snob, so I, I'm not like a huge film snob. I, I like Kung Fu films. I have my certain genres and subgenres within the Kung Fu okay. film world that I like. But there are people out there who are way bigger experts on like 
the film stuff than I am, mm-hmm. right? And the moment, you know, some I find it hard to believe. But. Well, the moment some, well, no, the, the, I mean, there are people, I've not specialized in film knowledge. I know a lot, but I mean, there, there are people out there that that's their only thing, right? They can't throw a punch or they don't know anything about martial arts, like real martial arts to save their life. Okay. But they'll tell you like how the scene was choreographed and who did it and all that kind of stuff, right? So I'm not necessarily that guy. All right. But when it comes to Hong Kong films, Bruce Lee, in my opinion, is a little, a lot like the Beatles. You know, there's the time before the Beatles and the time after the Beatles. Yeah. If you look at Hong Kong martial art films before Bruce Lee, okay, uh, of course you had the old Kwan Tak Heng and Sekin serials where he played Wong Fei Hong, and the, those were, you know, a lot of they were still black and white, and mm-hmm. and they had like a, a bit of a formula. You know, Wong, Wong Fei Hong was the upright. Uh, you know, Kwan Tak Hing's Wong Fei Hung was the upright guy who not only defeated the enemy, but also taught him a moral lesson at the end. Mm. And, you know, but the fight scenes were very, uh, had a little bit of an opera feel to it in terms of like, it's very kind of... It's like a bit, cookie cutter? A bit, no, a bit staccato. And oh, okay. like, you can kind of see the choreography beats in there, right? Oh, all right. And, uh, but they're, they're still classics for another reason. I mean, Kwan Tak Hing was amazing and Sekin and all that. I mean, mm-hmm. th- those films are quite great for a cultural perspective. But when you look at like what Shaw Brothers was doing in the years before Bruce Lee came, like you look at Come Drink With Me, those kind of films, like they were really great and they were very good films at a very high level because Shaw Brothers had bigger budgets than Golden Harvest. So that Golden Harvest was a struggling studio when Bruce Lee came on. I mean, they were shooting mm. the thing in Thailand because Raymond Chow didn't even have a, his own studio at that time. Okay, And, uh, you know, Shaw Brothers had a studio and they had like high level directors and they were looking at what the Japanese were doing and taking some like uh, uh, tips from how the Japanese were directing stuff like the higher end Japanese directors. So you had like really, you, I mean, you had schlock coming out of Shaw Brothers, but you also <laughs> had some high end films like Come Drink With Me and also um, uh, the uh, what was later called Five Fingers of Death, which was mm-hmm. a Kung Fu movie made in the very early 70s, predated Bruce Lee's films and came out before Bruce Lee even here. Uh, the Five Fingers of Death was released before Bruce Lee. And that's why a lot of people who are really old school, they're like, oh, no, Five Fingers of Death came right. out before Big Boss for them. Right now. What you always have is something, it's called the, the primacy effect, which is that the first thing you see often mm. makes the biggest impression. So that's why when you deal with like old school cats, like people who are maybe our age or a little bit older, they'll always talk about David Carradine. Like, oh man, I got into Kung Fu because of David Carradine, right? Oh, okay. And so no matter how much of a jackass it turns out David Carradine <laughs> was in real life, which I have my own run-ins with him, I can tell you about that. Um, or just how god-awful he was as a non-martial artists pretending to be a martial artist. We can touch on that another time. Right? The, the people who, who their first exposure was David Carradine, mm-hmm. they're gonna be like, oh man, he was so great. And the Kung Fu series and Kwai Chang Kane and all that kind of stuff, right? For me, I, you know, Kwai Chang Kane and, and David Carradine, it was not the first time I saw Kung Fu. The first time I saw Kung Fu was Enter the Dragon. Mm-hmm. So for me, the, the, the kind of the primacy yes. effect, the, the first right. person I saw, it was that. And the second Kung Fu film I saw after Enter the Dragon was Heroes of the East, directed by Lao Ka Leung, was starring Gordon Liu. Gordon Liu, yeah. And that is like, yeah, like if, yeah, if, the if hair. yeah, if Enter the Dragon, Enter the Dragon made me fall in love with Bruce Lee. Heroes of the East made me fall in love with Kung Fu. And to this day, okay. it's one of those films like you watch it from your childhood and you go, does this thing hold up? And I look at it now and I go like, not only does it hold up, it's really remarkably, it's a remarkably good film. It's a mm. Kung Fu porn of which the story in between is just a cheap excuse to get to the next fight. Okay. But it's very well executed. And uh, if people have not seen Heroes of the East, uh, with starring uh, Gordon Lau and uh, um, Yasuaki Kurata, mm. it's just amazing. The, the martial arts choreography, everything is really fantastic. Right. One, in my opinion, one of Lau Kar best films and a small handful of films uh, in which there are no deaths. Um, that, you know, because wow. a lot of Lao Kar Leung's films got a bit bloody. I mean, but there yeah. were a couple that um, Marshall Club uh, and Marshall Club for sure and uh, Heroes of the East. It was actually, there were actually no deaths in wow. there. It was, it was, these were films that were really just about showcasing the martial art and the martial arts lifestyle, right? All right. So anyway, like those are the movies I saw. So for me, that was Kung Fu. And I remember I started to, you know, see the Bruce Lee films and on Saturday, the World North All Shaw Brothers presentations, mm-hmm. Black Belt Theater here in the yes. East Coast. And then I remember one that my dad would go to the video store and he would rent stuff. And he didn't know, right? But he saw Kung Fu. And it was like the pilot or the Kung first Fu few section. episodes. No, I mean Kung oh, Fu, the, the actual, TV series. Oh, yeah, wow. On VHS. 
So it was like either a bunch of the episodes on VHS or it was a pilot or something. I remember he brought it. And I remember watching that and just going, this guy sucks. <laughs> like, like just because you have to imagine. Oh. You see Bruce Lee in Enter the Dragon. There's that opening scene with Sammo Hung. The whole movie, right? As a kid, as an eight-year-old kid, that a movie like that blows your mind. Never mind that yeah. the nudity as well, right? The movie blows right. your eight-year-old mind, right? You're like, oh, I want to be Bruce Lee, right? Uh -huh. You see Heroes of the East. It's like, I want to do Kung Fu. And then I saw David Carradine, and I'm like, is this guy Asian? Or what? Like, what is this what, guy? What's happening I remember here? just looking at like just being confused. very confused and just watching a move and going like, this guy is terrible. Oh. And so for me... I had a very opposite reaction to the Kung Fu TV series, right? Your primacy effect. Okay. Yeah, but people who are like a little older than me or saw David Carradine first, like even to this mm. day, you know, even our, our good friend Matt Pauly, he was like, oh, he got into Kung Fu first because he saw the Kung Fu TV series, right? And I look at that and I'm just like, oh, <laughs> right? N n never, mind my, my, never mind my personal run-in with David Carradine and just seeing yeah. what an absolute <laughs> tool of a human being he was, right? So like... They're like there's that whole thing right so anyway um but bruce lee he had you know done these films and done the this tv stuff in the u.s and when he came to hong kong he had a different idea of how to present this stuff and even the the pre-bruce lee martial art films let's say the mar the films that came out in like the five years before uh mm -hmm. big boss okay they were good some of them were very well directed movies i keep coming back to come drink with me because and uh one-armed swordsman those kind of like the classics or one arm boxer, I'm not sure. Uh, Jimmy Wang, Jimmy Wang Yu, right? No, oh, right. And and then you have uh, the you know the five dead uh, the five, five deadly fingers the five fingers of death, right? Mm -hmm. And those were like wow, those were amazing. But then you see Bruce Lee, and it doesn't matter if Come Drink with Me is just a better shot, higher budget, better movie. When you saw Bruce Lee, there was just something about the way he moved and the films. Even though when you look at Big Boss, I mean, the, the plot is very paper thin. Mm. It's a very low budget film. You could see it. It's shot in Thailand. It's, it's, it's you know, Bruce Lee himself was a bit underwhelmed by the, the quality of that movie, but mm -hmm. it ends up, you know, making him a big star. Sort of right? like our Kung Fury now, the way it's low budget, but it's so well done. Yes, and it just it just captured that energy. Yeah, although I I would argue that you know you were talking about the short Kung Fury, yes. right? Yeah, I would argue that there was a lot more production and foresight that went into that Kung Fury, which is maybe twenty minutes long, than in right. all of Big Boss. Okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, let's the let's is let, much higher let's than not Big give Boss. let's not give Lo Wei that much right. credit, right? right yeah, Bruce Lee right. got paid seventy five hundred dollars for that film. All right, which is still so, hard to believe. Yeah, pretty ridiculous, right? So. um yeah, so especially considering almost nine years earlier, Jim Brown, the football player, got, yeah. got like 35000 to make his first movie, right? So just to give you an idea. What was the so, first movie? I don't, I don't remember what that first movie was, but uh, he yes. got paid that much as an American athlete, and mm. Bruce Lee goes to Hong Kong and gets paid, you know, like a, a pittance, right, to, to, to do that film, right? So anyway, you, you hear like Bruce kind of talking about bringing this kind of Western sensibility to raise the quality of what's being done in Hong Kong, different camera angles, different ideas, and, and kind of raised... this conversation, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming, was after Big Boss and after the second movie, you know? So, uh, from what I understand from this before conversation... Before the Dragon. He, oh, no, no, way before. He, okay. he had... Well, if you say way before, I mean, all of this stuff happened in the span of two and a half years. I mean, you have to realize that Bruce Lee's entire career of yeah. those films right. is in the span Which of two, so two and a half years. Wow. So, you know, maybe a long time within that span, but this is not yeah. a long time at all. Meteoric yeah. rise. Yeah, it's the best yeah. way to describe it, right? Mm -hmm. So he, uh, um, you know, wants to add these kind of sensibilities to to it and wants to raise the level because he sees, I mean, I'm sorry, Jimmy Wang Yu for me is like the David Carradine of Hong Kong. I mean, when you look at the way Jimmy Wang Yu moves, and again, and a lot of people have a primacy effect kind of thing with Jimmy Wang Yu. Like some of their first, so they saw that or they saw Five Fingers of Death. So for them, it's like, oh, it's Low Lee. And, and those performances were I've great. I've heard that, yeah. But you, you, you really cannot compare it to just the raw charisma and brute athleticism of Bruce Lee. I mean, Jimmy Wang Yu, uh, to call Jimmy Wang Yu an athlete is, um, is stretching. I think he was a swimmer or something like that in Taiwan. So he was <laughs> okay. technically an athlete, right? But there's this cavernous gap between how he moved and how Bruce Lee moved, right? So you have yeah. this. So in this phone conversation, by the way, uh, what we'll get into later, maybe today's episode, maybe some other episode, it, it happened after Big Boss came out, and I think he had just finished filming Fist of Fury, but I don't think it was out yet. Okay. Which would put this conversation like 
late 71, early 72, mm -hmm. from what I understand. Uh, so, yeah, so that's kind of kind of where we're at. So let's um, let's listen a little bit further. So yeah, they real quick he mentions the Italian films, right? These are so-called spaghetti westerns. These were westerns yeah. Fistful that were of dollars. Yeah, that were shot in Italy, right? Okay. And that was Bruce Lee's template for his career because after he had constantly run into dead ends in the US, uh, from what I from what I understand, his student James Coburn told him, Well, why don't you do what Clint Eastwood do, did? Which is that, you know, as his career wasn't really going anywhere in Hollywood, he went to Italy and made those low budget spaghetti westerns and they were widely popular. And then he came back to the U.S. now having some films under his belt and having some street cred and then was able to, to break into the U.S. market. And so James Coburn basically told Bruce to, he could go back to Hong Kong, become big over there, and then use that to piggyback off and perhaps go into Hollywood bridge. from the back door, right? Seeking a bridge. Okay. Absolutely. So that that's what he talks is kind of, you know, um, go, do, go in that fistful of dollars Clint Eastwood route. Yeah, and I think this is interesting, too, because obviously Bruce Lee, for the longest time, he had his pet project of the silent flute, which was basically Jeet Kune Do philosophy in a film. Mm -hmm. And he really tried to get this thing produced, and he went all the way to India with James Coburn. They looked for set, you know, for places, locations, stuff like that. But there were a lot of problems with that, and ultimately the film didn't get made. And I think Bruce was very disappointed, and that's part of the reason why he decided to go over to Hong Kong and, and you know, do his own thing. But I think his first film, Big Boss, he uh, he had to kind of he was a bit under director Low Wei's thumb, so he had to kind of do the movie the way he wanted it. But <laughs> he kind of was he he was so obviously the star. He kind of broke out, even though Low Wei was kind of a, a very cookie cutter, copy and paste style director. And then the same for the second film. But by the time he had done the second film, I think Bruce saw that he was starting to get a little bit of leverage with yeah. Raymond Chow and that now he would be able to make the kind of films that he wanted to do. But he That's needed why they argued so much on that. Well, there's that, but it, but the point is that he had to put in the grunt work so that he could get to the point where he could start calling some of his, the, his own shots, mm -hmm. right? Where he's not totally under the thumb of some director telling him what to do. It's really the simplicity. It is. It really is. I mean, what it is is that what man has to get over is the conscious, yeah. the consciousness of himself. And uh, I always remember you said you have to shop more. So this is interesting because he basically is using a, 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 a Jeet Kune Do yeah. philosophy. If you can move with your tools, you know, from any angle, you know, you have, you have full control. Yeah. And he's referencing this to his film career, right? I think the reason why Bruce Lee, someone who is such an advocate for freedom of expression in martial arts, mm -hmm. obviously that was what he wanted in his life too, must have just felt so constrained by what Hollywood was trying to do with him, which is kind of make him the stereotypical representation of, of Asians at that time. Mm. And then even going to Hong Kong where he wants to have this big film career and then being under the thumb of a tyrant like Lo Wei and having to do this kind of essentially relatively lousy movie, which the only reason <laughs> Big Boss is any good is because it has Bruce Lee in it. I mean, yeah. originally, it, James Tien, who later became the, the co-star, he was supposed to be the main guy. If you can imagine Big Boss with James Tien as the main guy, I mean, this would be a very forgettable film, right? Yeah, completely different film. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. right? And so it's interesting that it seems that what Bruce wanted was to have that same level of freedom he has in his martial arts self-expression for making films. Because without that, I think he felt that those films were not complete representations of himself. That's right. And the clumsier, the more limited the object, the easier for you to punch on it. 
Although I have to admit, having taught martial arts for a very long time, you know, yeah. sometimes you have students who want to, you know, it, it's the same thing like in school. You ever have a the teacher goes, does anyone have any questions? And then there's always one person who raises their hand and they don't ask a question. They just <laughs> reiterate what the teacher said to kind of show that they know what the teacher said. Like they want to hear themselves talk. And uh -huh. so this is not to put Daniel Lee in a bad light, but uh -huh. he's like, you know, Bruce is talking about films. And then he's like, oh, it's like you said, like about sharpening your tools. Like, see, see, I'm listening to you. Like, you know, uh -huh. right. And <laughs> luckily, I mean, Bruce Lee obviously can can make a connection there between that. And I think that it was a very powerful one. Right. Mm. And I'm not saying that that's why Daniel Lee said it. But I just think it just kind of reminds me of when students are like, you know, like in Wing Chun, like, oh, Sifu. So we're supposed to keep our elbows in. Right. <laughs> like, oh, Sifu, we're supposed to go forward. Right. Yes. Yeah, like, yeah. 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 And you say yes. And then they're like, you know, then they're, they're, their ego has been pleasantly stroked for the day. Right. OK, let's continue. <laughs> Yeah, so you see, again, it's that ability to express himself freely, which mm. he's obviously applying to his martial arts. He's obviously applying to himself, and he's hoping to be able to apply that to his film so that his films are honest expressions of what he's feeling and what he wants to communicate rather than just vehicles to make money and be famous. Once, when I found that out, that's it. I mean, like my coming back to reviews the television series is mm -hmm. one of the major decisions. That's right. Yeah, it's also interesting, too. Now, it's not clear, is he talking about Kung Fu, the TV series, or is he talking about his proposed Warrior project, which, of course, recently got made, um, you know, in the, the Warrior series on, on Cinemax, which is now on HBO, uh, based on that treatment that he wrote, right? Because th there's a, a lot of back and forth as to whether, how um, was Bruce Lee really up for that role of Kung Fu, or was he just one of the people that they were considering, or was did he actually have a hand in in, in writing it or mm. contributing into it? And it seems like what's kind of come out now um, that this was a project that was developed kind of parallel to Bruce Lee, and Bruce was one of the people they may have considered, but they ended up not going with him. So that idea that he was more directly involved with the Kung Fu TV series, I think, is a bit of a myth. And so I believe he's probably talking about the proposed Warrior series, which, of course, now has mm, actually has been, made, been made. Yeah. <laughs> well, you actually reached a point, you become very, uh, actually, quite philosophical. You see the ultimate goal. Well, let me say this. I mean, I haven't as yet been able to control my anger, <laughs> which I have uh, this, uh, violent this anger. Comes, this comes by... by... Violent <laughs> anger. <laughs> violent right. anger. Yeah, see, it's interesting because, like, obviously Bruce Lee's known to many as being, uh, you know, very philosophical. And a lot of that, well, it's true. I mean, he was very much into certain types of philosophies, especially um, J. Krishnamurti mm -hmm. in his application to kind of like not being bound by certain dogmatic ideas. Uh, and you, you can hear those strains in what he talks about, right? But on the same hand, uh, or on the other hand, I should say, he is uh, someone who struggles with, things that everyone else struggles with, right? Mm -hmm. For for some people, it's discipline. For other people, it's something else. And for Bruce Lee, it was, it was his temper. Yeah. And it, it seems a bit of a shame that the latest iteration of Bruce Lee through the Lee estate is to kind of whitewash these kind of things, yeah. right? That, uh, you know, Bruce Lee was like this perfect warrior philosopher uh -huh. who was flawless. And, you know, the only issues that he ever had to deal with was a very racist Hollywood. But other than that, Bruce Lee was some kind of perfect saint or something. I, like that, I right? feel like he went the philosophical route to uh, basically manage his anger. Well, there is yeah. that too. But I also think the, the problem is that people, they always want to look at things in a very binary way. Mm -hmm. Like if you're philosophical, uh, you're either a philosophical person or you're an angry person, <laughs> right? And it's totally possible to have a very philosophical and very principle-based view of life or certain aspects of your life, and not of others, all right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, for example, in my life, I'm extremely disciplined about my martial arts training, okay? Like, like how much I train a week, and my physical training, and mm -hmm. like making sure I have enough sleep, and my diet, and all of that kind of stuff, right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we look at like, 
um, organizing my old notes, which is like this perpetual project that I've wanted to do for a very long time. Mm. I'm extremely undisciplined when it comes okay. to that, right? So, and, and, and other little projects that I, you know, I'm like, I write a book, very disciplined about that. Um, you know, making a list of all my rare books for my wife so that when I die, she can sell them all. Uh, I'm maybe I'm <laughs> yes. less motivated yes. about that one for other There's reasons. There's no right? motivation yes. for that. I guess I, you know, jokingly told her, and I yeah. mentioned this on the Dudes of Kung Fu podcast before, like, uh, oh yeah, I have this original Jack 1952 Jack Dempsey championship fighting. Oh, I have two of yeah. those. And I have this book and this original printing of this. And like, oh, this is worth that much. And she's like, you need to write these things down and let me know. So when you die, I know what to sell and what I can throw away. <laughs> <laughs> so savage, I love so, it. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't matter how long you've been my student. Mm. Make no mistake, when I croak, you're not getting any of my stuff oh, unless you buy it from her. Right? She's, uh, she's got to put a price tag nice, on everything yeah. there, right? Oh, man. So, um, <laughs> you know, but like, but so it's possible that you could have, like, for example, perhaps Bruce Lee, mm -hmm. and I'm just speculating here, was very disciplined in certain aspects of how he viewed life and how he viewed interpersonal relationships and... Uh, also how he viewed his martial arts training and martial arts in general, but perhaps not so philosophical when it came to reacting to stuff, right? Mm. Because, you know, there's a stimulus, someone says something, someone does something, and then there's this gap between that stimulus and your reaction to it. <laughs> and usually in that gap, that's where the teachable moment is, right? Yeah. And what you do, and you can either react to something or you can respond to it. Reacting okay. is almost out of your control. You just kind of like you have that gut, yeah. you know, reaction, right? Instincts. But if you respond to something, it can be a lot more measured, right? So I think the, the big thing that we all struggle is learning how to uh, deal with the stimulus and not immediately reacting in that kind of way and uh, learning how to kind of separate. How, how we feel about something which with how we should respond to it okay. with how much power does this thing actually have over my life, right? Mm. Rather than just kind of dealing with it. Now, Bruce Lee was 32 when he died, okay? So I find that in many fairly, respects, fairly young, yeah. he was very well ahead and very, very mature for his age. But we're still talking about a 30-something-year-old guy. I am now 43. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this kind of more philosophical side of my asp, like my personality, like I can look at something and not, even if it's aggravating, not immediately react to it, is something I've only been developing in the last few years. Okay. Certainly at 32, I wasn't that way, right? So you can understand, like Bruce Lee would always I say, it's like very a process, reactive right? At 32, very yeah. reactive, right? <laughs> I mean, the, the stuff I, I would get, like, especially when I was in Civil Learning Things organization, people would write stuff and I'd be like, and then, like you were totally wrong, like that. And now I, I, I see that stuff and I go, like, uh, uh, I, very disassociated to it because it's like that that stuff cannot, like, how can how can you let, Bobo Sauce eighty two on YouTube, what this what this guy writes like trigger you in such a way where now the rest of your day is ruined because somebody you don't know who has an unqualified opinion said something. Yeah. And here's the thing, if someone says something that is true, and it upsets you, mm. then you need to have another conversation with yourself. Mm. All right, maybe I'm not. Mm. Maybe I don't believe the right thing, or maybe yeah, I okay. need to change something about the way I believe. Right. So again, it's about the gap between the stimulus in either your response or your reaction to it, right? Mm. And so Bruce was 30, 31 at the time of this phone conversation. So it's totally understandable yeah. that this is something that he struggles with, right? So. Yeah, and you heard Daniel Lee says there, oh, well, that comes with age, yeah. right? <laughs> like, you know, absolutely. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stop that one there. Uh, hold on. What is going on here? Oh, sorry. I'm the sound guy today. I apologize for that. <laughs> nice. All right. Um, because uh, we have it in clips, so I'm going to play the second one there. Because right at the tail end of that, okay. Bruce Lee mentioned someone, and I think probably the rest of today's episode, we're just going to talk about the guy that he mentioned. And let me play that again. So he goes, like Lao Dai Chun, right? Dai he has yet Chun. to come up to me and slap me. And if he does, that'll be the end of him. Wow. Okay. 
So uh, to g- give you some idea, and I've talked about Lao Tai Chun before on the Dudes of Kung Fu podcast. So Lao Tai, Lao tai Chun is an interesting character because there is in kind of the lore of Hong Kong fights uh, was supposedly a fight between Bruce Lee and Lao Tai Chun. And uh, in fact, with this Bruce Lee expert who shall yet remain nameless, okay. the one that gave me a little bit of information about the Daniel Lee uh, phone conversation, uh, I mentioned it to him and he, he didn't know too much about it, but he's since been looking some stuff up and he found some interesting Ooh. things, right? So as a longtime Bruce Lee fan, especially pre-internet days, right? Because nowadays you go on Bruce Lee's Wikipedia page and read that. And while not everything is maybe 100% accurate, you can find more, you can find out more about Bruce Lee in five minutes then you would easily be able to in 1985. Like you would have to like really piece this stuff together yeah. to get kind of a basic idea. So it was easy in those times for this is a rampant speculation about things about like who he fought and how he trained and how he died and all this kind of stuff. Because, you know, especially growing up on the East Coast, we all grew up with someone like, hey, yeah. I know how Bruce Lee died. There's a bunch of ninjas that, you know, because he was teaching. Uh, they jumped down on yeah, him. Yeah, he was teaching, you know, the non-Chinese. So a bunch of ninjas came because that makes sense. And they killed him. I mean, so obvious. That's ninjas what I, was my, the biggest thing yeah, in 85. My, my sensei told me that, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when you grow up, like, during the 80s, you, you know, you got your boy from the Bronx who's going to tell you, ah, Shokasuki came at him. I'll tell you, I know how Bruce Lee died, right? And then, of course, and there's always like, oh, did you know Bruce Lee fought this guy? Did you know Bruce Lee fought that guy, right? Yeah. You know, my sensei, he fought Bruce Lee, and he said he was not that good, right? Like, so, you know, <laughs> right, you, like, right. so the problem is when you grow up being a huge fan of Bruce Lee and not always having all the access to this stuff, you grow up hearing, like, all these things, and after a while, you start to go, this is mostly BS. Mm. Right? I'm reading in the martial art magazines about Bruce Lee, and I'm like, yeah, what, you know, my, my boy from the Bronx told me it doesn't really jibe what this guy wrote in the magazine who actually knew Bruce Lee, right? Mm. So what happens is, you, <laughs> after a while, I turned off believing anybody about anything they said about Bruce Lee, all right? Wow. Unless I heard Bruce Lee say it, or this person really knew Bruce Lee, I don't care what uh, Sivu Jim Janglebuck from Pennsylvania says happened to Bruce Lee. Okay, he came up in. in he comes up a episode. lot. He comes up a lot, right? I want to go to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is a great place. Like, I'll tell you, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say who it was, but uh-huh. two two years ago, I was at an event in Brooklyn, and there was a Wing Chun Sifu there, very senior, older guy, and I I don't know him too well. I only saw him a couple times, right? And we're in line, and he oh, comes man. up to me. He's like, "Oh, Sifu Alex," and then we start talking. It was. He's someone who's been teaching way, way, way longer than me, and he's been around for a very long time, right? But I didn't know him too much personally. But I saw him in this line. I'm not gonna say who he is. <laughs> and he goes like, and he goes like, yeah, my Sivu told me like, you know, about the relationship between Bruce Lee and Yip Man. And uh, you know me, I'm one of those. I got two ears and a mouth. All right, so I'm gonna listen twice as much as I talk, mm. unless I'm doing the podcast, of course. Yeah. So like when people, you know, when I'm around people who talk or they got stories, I'm always silent. Because I don't learn anything if I talk, right? So I want to hear, at least if the guy is full of crap, mm. I learn that he is full of crap, right? Like my uh, Sifu Lang Ting used to always say, this is called a negative education. And a negative education is an education nonetheless. Sometimes oh, you just have to find wow. out this guy's got a totally wrong opinion about something. But if you shut up long enough, you'll find out what yeah. this person's well-fleshed out yet incorrect opinion may be, right? So anyway, I'm listening to this guy, and he's saying, yeah, my Sifu knew about this, the relationship between Bruce Lee. And Bruce Lee got kicked out of the Wing Chun school. And I'm thinking, like, mm, mm, okay, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. All right. I'm going to say, like, you just let him when go with and it. for why and who and whatever. Yeah. And, and he opened up a school in Hong Kong before he came to the States. And he's telling me that Bruce Lee opened, like, a brick-and-mortar school in Hong Kong shortly before he came to the U.S. <laughs> and I'm going, like, first of all, and he's, again, it was on the ground floor. And I'm going like... Well, he was like 18. Yeah, he was 18. And it's like, do you, do you know what real estate costs in Hong Kong, man? Bruce Lee is going to open a Wing Chun school on the ground floor. There, I think, there, I think there are almost no Kung Fu schools that have ever been on the ground floor of any building in Hong Kong. The, re- the, 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 wow. the real estate is ridiculous, right? Maybe a handful. Maybe I uh, heard Tan... Tan uh, Tan Hong Chung, the Hongar master, had like a ground level floor. And also uh, Lok Chi Fu maybe had a white crane school at some point, maybe in the 50s or something, yeah. right? Basically. But yeah, I mean, like generally Kung Fu schools in Hong Kong, they're on the 11th floor of some building, right? Yeah, they're not on the ground floor. Mm. All right. Same like in New York, right? Yeah. So anyway, this guy's telling me this and he's like, yeah. And then Bruce would put it, had this, this on the window. He had like this sheet and there was a silhouette and you could see him in there doing stuff, but you had to walk in. And so, and he's telling me all this stuff. And I'm like, this is like something that my boy from the Bronx told me when I was nine years old. 
And this is a grown ass man telling me this story. And I'm going like, timeline wise, this doesn't make sense. I've never uh-huh. heard anything like this before. And it doesn't make, you know, sometimes if you don't know if a story is true or not from a factual perspective, like you just don't have the facts, you just give it the say it out loud test. Yeah. For me, for me, the, the BS detector is always like, okay, let me say this story out loud as if it really happened. Mm. And if it comes off like there's some leaps of logic you have to go through for the story to make sense. As you're saying it. Probably bullshit, right? If you follow Occam's razor, like you make the least amount of assumptions and that is probably yeah. the real story, right? And there's just too many leaps of logic you have to make. <laughs> but he's telling me this stuff and I'm like, uh-huh. And so that's part of what I mean. Like when you grow up around Chinese martial arts and Bruce Lee, you have to, you're forced oftentimes, especially if you teach martial arts like me, to suffer people telling you their very unqualified opinions or telling you stories that they certainly believe. Wow. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't believe that he's lying. I believe that he believes he that story happened. It. I'm yeah. sure someone told it to him, right? But there's nothing to support it, right? Wow. So that's why I heard at some point that Bruce Lee fought a guy named Lao Tai Chun. And I'm like, Never heard of it. Why why do I even care? Never heard of the fight. Never heard of the guy. Mm. When I first heard this phone conversation, and then you hear Bruce Lee say, Lao Tai Chun. I remember when I heard this phone conversation for the first time when I found it on YouTube years and years ago, and I heard him say the name Lao Tai Chun. I go, what? This was real. That really happened. So this Lao Tai Chun thing was real. And then I started to do a little bit of, uh, you know, my, my, yeah, my very unqualified, um, you know, uh, research into this, right? Rabbit hole. Yeah. And so I, I realized like, okay, first of all, Lao Tai Chun was an actor around the time of Bruce Lee. All right. Mm. And so um, his entire film career, if you look on IMDb and also, you know, some people will be like, oh, well, that's not where you look. You go to the Hong Kong movie database. The Hong Kong movie database and IMDb on Lao Tai Chun are exactly the same. In fact, probably whoever did his IMDb just copied it from the Hong Kong one, right? So I checked both so that people don't go, oh, you didn't really do your research, right? Yo. He made a handful of movies, okay? And uh, I'm, I'm going to actually look to see uh, the, the movies that he made because they're kind of funny, right? Yo. His entire film career went from 1972 to 1974. So we're talking, this is, this is like overlapping with, yeah. um, with Bruce Lee's career, all right. all right? Around the same time and just one year after Bruce Lee. And then, and then his career was done. And then I looked at his IMDb, or his Hong Kong movie database, and I look at the the roles that he played. And it's like, Yu Yang's brother, number one, brothel boss, gangster, <laughs> just gangster, I want to play a brothel boss. Yeah, so M- <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chow. So you look at his database, his five films, and you go, oh, he's he's an extra. As the Hong Kong would say, Kelefe. Kelefe mm. is a background extra. But they use the term Kelefe. Kelefe yeah, is a Hong Kong slang where you mean, you mean for like a Mr. Nobody. All right. Like oh, remember, I love remember, this. I remember, say this all the time, everywhere now. Yeah. Remember when I did the, when we did the Fight Quest episode and I talked yeah. about that uh, TVB actor, right? Well, he's a Kelefe. Kelefe. Right? He's a kind of a Mr. Nobody who cares, background actor, right? <laughs> and so, um, so anyway, Lao Tai Chun, for all intents and purposes, was a bit of a calafé, right? So it makes sense, like, oh, why was he calling out Bruce Lee in the papers? Because he wants to make a name for himself, mm. right? This is the oldest trick in the book. You're a, basically a Mr. Nobody. And what do you do? Like, like even when I made my, uh, uh, a year ago, I made some Kung Fu Genius video about, like, the, the Kunto, that fake form. And then some guy made some video or whatever. Oh, yeah. Like, I can't even we bring can't myself even to watch it, name. Right? Right, right? Yeah, but I mean, like, but it's like, <laughs> who the hell are you, right? You know, like, you know, it's like, 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 what's this guy's opinion, and who, who yes. why should I even care, right? So Lao Tai Jun is essentially a calife who's trying to make a name for himself in the papers. And I looked up uh, because I have access. Uh, there's a website online where you can go in, and it has uh, all the Hong Kong periodicals, all the newspapers from like 1912, 1920 to present day. So, and they're all digitized. So you can put in Chinese characters and it'll just search all the articles that have that. So I put in Yip Man and found all the articles with Yip Man, including the newspaper articles while Yip Man was alive. Because mm. I'm not just interested in what people have written about him since. I want to know, like, what, what was the newspaper writing about Yip Man when he was alive? What was the newspaper writing about Bruce Lee when he was alive? So I've collected all these articles and I looked up Lao Tai Chun. 
And I found a number of articles where he's there, like, shaking his fist, saying, you know, that his boxing, because he was some kind of boxer, perhaps even Golden Gloves level boxer. And he said his boxing would crush Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do. So he was really going after Whoa. it, right? And so, but it was all in the paper, just like Bruce Lee said in the conversation. He's like, oh, he's just in the paper, right? But he has yet to come up to me and slap my face. And that would be the end of him if he did anyway, right? And so the story was, wow. okay, like, there was this stuff going back and forth. And then on the other hand, Supposedly, they actually did fight, but no one, you, you, you cannot get any clear, like no one is, it's not like Wong Jack Man where everyone know that ha knew that happened or like even his fight in Seattle against a Japanese guy uh, uh, named Yoichi, like we know that happened, the Gary Elms boxing fight, so we know so the extra from Enter the Dragon, we know these things, right? Mm. But the Lao Tai Chun is kind of like, mm, some people, and some people in Hong Kong will be like, no, the fight didn't happen. And other people would be like, the fight did happen. Mm. So I, around 2014, when I was doing my research for Tang Sang, got interested in it because supposedly the fight between Bruce Lee and Lao Tai Chun happened at Tang Sang's home. Because Tang Sang at that time, he had a very nice house in um, Fan Leng. Fan Leng is where Yip Man is buried, right? That area there in the new yeah. territory, like, like countryside. You can imagine he's a very rich uh, Tom Chung, uh, detective, right? Why is he rich? Well, we can get into that That's another day, right? Another episode, but he has yeah. a he has this this fat pad up in Fun Leng, right? So he's got like a nice little mansion, right? We gotta visit this. And this uh, I've been looking for it, right? It's one of my it's one of the things I'm trying to find. All right, all right. And uh, he was helping Yip Man in the late '60s train up some fighters to fight in a full contact contest. So Tang Sang, being a man of means, he was helping to train the fighters. He built a boxing ring in his backyard. So he had a boxing ring in the backyard mm. of his home, which was for getting the Wing Chun fighters acclimated to fighting in the ring. And we'll talk about that more when we do part two of the uh, fighters, uh, the tournament fight uh, history thing. I'll right. talk about uh, Lao, uh, that, uh, Tang that Sang's is ring, part right? Of the history, yeah, yeah. So supposedly Tang Sang was a guy uh, who he liked fighting and he liked pitting people against each other. <laughs> all right, he, he, uh, he's he like was a Don King. Yeah, he was he was a Wing Chun guy, right? All right. Um, he's a police detective. But he was also a huge martial arts fan. And he loved fighting contests. And he would often act as a referee in many fighting contests. So he was like super, super into it, right? But he also, and from what I've heard from people who knew him, he liked to stir the pot. And he would sometimes, you know, kind of maybe tell this Sifu, oh, that Sifu said something about you and tell that Sifu, that Sifu <laughs> said something about you. Because he wanted to see in that very childlike way what happens when the Choi Li Fat guy fights the Wing Chun guy? What happens when the Hong Kun guy fights the Tai Sing Pekwa guy? He, he, he was one of these guys and he just kind of wanted to sit back mm. and watch and mm. see these guys kind of tear each other apart, right? Yeah. So supposedly, and he was also a very influential person. So supposedly, the fight, you know, this back and forth between Bruce Lee and Lao Tai Chun, although I don't think there was a lot of back and forth. I think it was mostly just Lao Tai Chun, right? Because uh, I don't think Bruce was even bothered to respond to it. Supposedly it came to a head and then eventually Tang Sang arranged a fight. And him being a police detective, they don't have to worry about uh, anyone getting in trouble for fighting because he's doing it at his place and he's a police oh, detective, man. right? So so there's no God, worry, there's no so problem wild. about like the legality of the fight because oh. you have one one of the most no powerful, raids. one of the most yeah. powerful detectives in Hong Kong. Like he's, I mean, nothing's going to happen, right? <laughs> oh, so, yes. But the problem is that the people, they don't, some people believe the fight happened. Uh, Bolo Yang. Uh, he has a story where he says he kind of mentioned it to Bruce Lee and Bruce Lee kind of nodded smilingly but, the, but didn't fully admit or not admit the fight happened wow. and then there are other people who are Some like the fight didn't happen. Type right? Thing. Yes. So, um, supposedly the fight happened at Tang Tan's home in the boxing ring. Okay? So anyway, uh, I'll try to keep this brief because we have so much to talk about when we talk about Tang San. Uh, in 2014, I, I, I wanted to write a book about Tang Sang, and many of my longtime listeners and followers know that I had actually talked about writing a book about Tang Sang for the longest time. Mm -hmm. But I, I ran into a number of dead ends. Namely, I could not get in contact with his family. So there was just so many things about him that I just could not find out. And there were so many contradictory stories and fuzzy memories. And I just realized that I probably know more about Tang Sang than uh, anyone outside of his immediate family or immediate friends know. But that's also mm. like saying I have a trope. I'm the I'm the world's loudest whisperer. All right, it's a very <laughs> dubious distinction because there's such little information out there on him. I probably okay. just compiled all of it, but it's cumulatively it wasn't quite enough for the book, which is why I kind of dropped that project, which I had mm. talked so much about because I was so excited about it. For now, he's a fascinating figure, yeah. And I'm a huge Tang Sang fan for like the, the, for a lot of reasons. And like I said, mm -hmm. we'll get into it. 
So um, anyway, in 2014, I went to Hong Kong starting this Dang Sang research. And it brought me to an old Sifu named uh, Liu Ji Keng. Liu Ji Keng was one of the eight founders of the Hong Kong Chinese Martial Art Association, along with Tang Sang and a number of other people, Lok Chi Fu, Kwan Tak Heng, all these guys. And they formed this martial arts association, which was to kind of uh, band all the martial arts together under a common roof, right? Mm. It was for all the Chinese martial arts in Hong Kong. And like they would have meetings and they would promote Chinese Kung Fu in general. So it wasn't about one particular style. And this organization still exists today and they still have their headquarters there on uh, Nathan Road, uh, which I've been wow. to. And it's the same place that it was back then. And so you can see lots of old photos there. And one of the founders was Liu Ji Kang. Now, Liu Ji Kang was a Sifu of Yao Gong Mun. Now, from what I understand, and I could be wrong, so for you Yao Gong Mun practitioners out there, if I'm wrong, hey, I'm a Wing Chun guy, all right? Excuse me, all right? We're yeah. often wrong about things. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, Yao Gong Mun is a bit of an offshoot or a variation of White Eyebrow. Mm. And so from what I understood, the White Eyebrow, Bak Mei, um, is was a style in Hong Kong was notoriously linked to the triads. And so the Yao, and this is just what I was told, the Yao Gong Mun is essentially the same style as White Eyebrow, but they kind of rebranded so that they wouldn't be associated with the, with the Bak Mei guys who are like all triads, right? That's what yeah. I understand. And I could be totally wrong about that, right? Uh, so anyway, um, Leo Chi Kong was a Yao Gong Mun practitioner and Sifu, but he never taught. And so I was introduced to him by uh, someone very high up at the Hong Kong Chinese Martial Arts Association. He says, hey, Liu Chi Kung is still alive. You can talk to him. He knew Dang Sang. And wow. I went to his home, which was also his Dita clinic. He, used to, he was a bone setter, but he's oh. retired. And, um, and I believe, although I'm not 100% sure, I believe he's since passed. I cannot confirm it. Just when I saw him in 2014, he had had a major stroke and he okay. was uh, not in good condition. Gotcha. But he still agreed to he was see talking me. talking though, right? No, he wasn't okay, talking. Very gotcha. little, very slow, very labored, right? Mm. And, but he agreed to see me. And I went and I saw him and I had at that point only seen old photos of him in the magazines. And, you know, and then to see him like in person, like yeah. he, he was in these old black and white photos with Yip Man and all these other guys. And it's like, oh. Like mm. and there he was, and he, you know, he he couldn't move. He was like paralyzed on one side, and sat and talked to him. And his wife was there, and his wife was kind of interpreting, and 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 I'd ask him a question, and she would kind of you know help help uh, him communicate to me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he was so sweet to me, and he kept like with his one arm, he kept grabbing me, saying like, "Oh, you're so strong, and oh, so good. Kung fu is still being practiced, and and like you know, I'm very cool. happy that you're like he was so super sweet, right? And it was like it was really, really very, very oh. sweet man. And I asked him, I said, uh, Liu Sifu, like, um, do you know about the Tang Sang fight, or the supposed fight at Tang Sang's home between Bruce Lee and Lao Tai Chun? And he said, yes. And he just answers like that in that very Chinese way. By the way, if you've ever had a Chinese instructor before, you know, you'll often get, you'll, you'll ask a very direct question and they'll just give you the direct answer. And yeah. there's no like I love that. context, right? I love that. So I'm like, did you hear about this fight? Yes. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there and I'm like, you know, and of course he's an, like, look, he's an older gentleman. He had a str I don't want to like bother him. Right. Yeah. But I, I want to get this information yeah, from you him. Right? So I'm like, teeth, but yeah, it's hard but to you don't want to, teeth. right. He's so sweet. And his wife made us tea. And mm. it was so nice. Right? And it was funny because he had this old couch there and, and he goes like, oh, you know, Bruce Lee used to come here and he used to like do some dieta on Bruce. Like when wow. Bruce had some, and he's like, yeah. And he used to like be over there on that couch and stuff. And I was like, oh. You sat on the couch. Like I right? sat on the couch. <laughs> yeah, sat on the couch. <laughs> so, uh, you know, whether he had replaced the couch and forgot he had replaced the couch and that was not the couch or yeah. not or whatever, but it was the same room that Bruce Lee had been in. So I was very excited, right? And then I go, <laughs> uh, Leo Sivu, I go, so like I had my second question. Uh, Leo Sivu, um, so, because uh, I first asked him, like, did, did you hear about the fight? He's like, yes. And I'm like, um, do you know if the fight actually happened or not? Yes. <laughs> and then I'm like, um, do you know? I'm if like, it happened yeah, I know. And I, yes. and I go, okay. At this point, I realize, you got a yes. No, it's my my fault for asking a two part. The, yeah, we're asking yes these no. slightly open ended questions that can be yeah. interpreted that way. So I'm like, all right, I gotta get, I gotta nail him to this. Mm. All right. Uh, how do you know the fight between Bruce Lee and Lao Tai Chun really happened? And then he looks at me and he says. I was there. And I remember he said that and I was like, almost got dizzy in that moment because this is like, for, for Bruce Lee insiders on the Hong Kong side of things, this is a bit of a holy grail like about this yeah. fight. Did it happen or not? And I was like, uh, 
he's, he's like, he tells me he was there and I didn't expect an answer like that. So I'm almost like was discombobulated for a moment. Like, like, what is my follow up going to be? Were right? you standing up? At no, this I was. I was or... kind of like, oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> right. Uh, so I go, uh, what uh, what happened in the fight? Who won? Can you tell me who won? And he goes, uh, no, I'm not going to talk about it. And then the guy who was there from the Hong Kong Chinese Martial Arts Association says, oh, you know, Liu Sivu, he was a good friend of Bruce Lee's, and he also knew Lao Tai Chun. And so in a very, you have to understand the Chinese wow, gentleman. Saving face for, for It's all about saving whoever, face, right? Yeah, forever. Lost. Even if the person is passed away mm. or maybe, you know, whatever went on. Like, one thing I really respect about that, that part of Chinese culture when it's adhered to, which it's not always adhered to, um, is that, you know, they're very, even if the person is long since passed, they're like, I'm not going to talk about it. And they and, and that's usually the final word on that, right? Mm. And then so, you know, it's like, so, you know, who won the fight? Oh, I'm not going to talk about that. And I'm th thinking there and I'm like, Leo Sivu, uh, can you tell me who lost the fight? <laughs> like, I'm just going like, maybe like I just, yeah, I just ask him the other way, right? And he just looks at me and he's like, and then I go, is there anything you can tell me about it? And he goes, well, it was at Tang Sang's home. Okay. And it happened. I went up there. I he's like, I rarely went to Tang Sang's home, but I went up there because he told us about it. And so it was kind of a big deal. Mm. And his wife was there and he said, yeah, it was like in 72. He said something like around when it happened. And his wife goes, you told me you went to play Mahjong. <laughs> and I was like, and you see him. Even though the stroke had paralyzed half his face, you right. see, like, all of a sudden, it's like his wife Shit. caught him <laughs> lying <laughs> about something that happened 40 years ago, like a little white lie. He went to Tang Sang's home <laughs> to watch this fight between Bruce Lee and Lao Tai Chun, but he Yo. told his wife he was just going to play mahjong or cards or Yo. something, right? I don't know if it was mahjong or something, play something, right? And then you just saw it, and he looked at me like he didn't have a lot of expression because his face couldn't move, right? And then you just see he looked at me, and he was like, <laughs> and it's like oh man wives have a steel trap yes. of a mind for stuff like that right oh the memory and, and then he's like you know somewhat embarrassed right and then he wouldn't really say anything else after that right <laughs> at this and, point yeah. and then so you know after that I realized okay but at least I had confirmation that the fight had happened mm. um, because uh, Tony Lau Tony Lau um, uh, Lau Wing do you remember in the uh, old uh, Bruce Lee film, in uh, Big Boss, he was the Big Boss's son, and Bruce Lee kills him with the punch. Oh, Boom, yeah, and then the after that, he looks punch. at his fist, yeah, right? The and then uh, in he was in Fist of Fury, but he was just one of the background students of uh, Jing Mo Moon. And then he's in Way of the Dragon. He's Tony. He's one of the waiters. And then he was in Enter the Dragon. He was the tournament fighter that uh, John Saxon defeated. Yeah. All right? So that's Tony yeah. Lau. So he was in a number of Bruce Lee's movies, yeah. and he knew Bruce Lee well, right? Because... He was on record. Someone asked him about the Lao Tai Chun fight, and he said it didn't happen. All right, so that's why I said like, like you would talk to different people, and of course, I heard he was there, and he said there was no fight, and then he said he wasn't there. But uh, and this is not to say anything bad about uh, Lao Wing, but uh, I know a friend of mine interviewed him for a Bruce Lee project a few years ago, and asked him like, um, what was it like going to Bruce Lee's funeral because Bruce Lee was your friend, right? And uh, Lao Wing answered, he said, um, I was so devastated by Bruce Lee dying, I didn't go to the funeral. But I remember this, yeah. But there's footage. If you, if you look at the funeral footage, he was at the funeral. Right. Right? So and again, Which, it's it's yeah. not it's not to say like he's lost his mind or, mm. or that he's suffering from some cognitive decline. It's just that the memory is 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 a very tricky thing. Mm -hmm. And we misremember stuff all the time. In fact, there's a great book called um, uh, called subliminal and it talks about the problem of memory okay. like when you you were at an event and then they even did lots of tests where they they would t they had an event happen in a university and they told everyone to write down what just happened and they put those in envelopes and five years later they asked them to describe the same event and they, these were people who were there and the accounts were so far off the rails, right? So that's why whenever, Please even when I tell these us. stories and stuff, you always have to take it with a grain of salt because memory is a very tricky thing. We we often have narratives in our head that we of how we want things to be mm. and that influences our word choice, which, which influences the story. So I can imagine Lao Wing, Tony Lao, uh -huh. was very devastated by Bruce Lee's funeral. 
or, or by Brucey's death, I should say, and okay. probably had reservations about going to the funeral and probably felt terrible about it and at some point blanked out in his memory that he had actually gone. So I don't think this is a cognitive decline issue. I think that that's how he felt and, and he okay. forgot that he was there. I find I mix up memories. Yes, I find so, you do that too. Yeah, and, and, and he probably mixed up thinking he went to a different funeral, but it was Bruce Lee's. You know, it's like, possible. It's yeah. possible. But anyway, but so so you always have to like okay, so he was a bit unreliable on whether he was at Bruce Lee's funeral or not, and we see the video that yeah. he was at Bruce Lee's okay. funeral, right? So okay, you have he says shades on. He said the Lao Tai Chi yeah. thing didn't fight happen oh, or whatever, right? Man. But Leo Ji Kang told me he was there, and but he wouldn't tell me what happened. Mm. And then when I left. This high ranking because his wife was right there. Maybe, <laughs> he was right? To... This a high ranking person at the Hong Kong Chinese Martial Arts Association. Um, he told me he goes, I, I know what happened at the Lao Tai Chun fight, and uh, I was like, and I'm thinking it's so funny because that guy, that guy, I'm not gonna say who he is because you know, he told me this in confidence. He was bringing me around to meet different sifus from that time period. So he was like my guide. Meanwhile, he's the one who knows the answer to the story the whole time, right? Like I could have just asked him, right? Wow. Instead of like fuzzy memories with old Sifu's tour of Hong Kong, right? Uh, he, he could have just answered it for me. So he says, uh, yes, the fight happened at Dang Sang's home. And uh, they fought in the boxing ring behind, you know, the, the, the one that Dang Sang had there. And Lao Tai Chun came out. And, uh, you know, Bruce Lee you know, came out as well. And Lao Tai Chun comes out in kind of a boxing stance moving around. And what he said is that Bruce gave Lao Tai Chun one kick, just one kick. And I believe, and of course, look, fuzzy <laughs> memories, okay? And he's telling you this story, this story secondhand already. I mean, who knows, mm -hmm. okay? So, you know, if someone is listening to this and they were there and they're like, no, it was two kicks. <laughs> no, it was, you know, because people love to call you out on that stuff, right? Uh -huh. It's like, I wasn't there and I'm going to roll the dice. You weren't there either, uh, all right? So he gave Lao Tai Chun one kick, and Lao Tai Chun just went down. Bus broke his rib or bust his rib or knocked the wind out of him or both. And it was it. It was one fight. So kind of some of them say, like, oh, there was no fight, meaning that's coded language for it, it, was, it was not even a fight oh, okay. because you're looking at an amateur versus a professional. Wow. And other people say there wasn't a fight because supposedly the story wasn't. I talked to Matt Polly about this off the record because Bruce had done this a couple other times. After Bruce did so easily and handily defeated Lao Tai Chun, supposedly, according to the story, according to my source, was this true or not? According to lore. According to lore, right? Um, Bruce told the people who were there who witnessed it not to say anything about it because Lao Tai Chun was an actor and Bruce did not want this guy to lose face and to lose his acting career. Because in Hong Kong, imagine wow. you're an action actor and it turns out you get beat up so embarrassingly. That's kind of the end of your act. Who wants to see this guy be in an action yeah, movie? It's not, just be it's not believable anymore, right? Yeah. So Bruce did not want this guy to lose his career because he had, you know, um, overestimated his abilities against the, you know, the great Bruce Lee. And supposedly Bruce Lee paid for his hospital visit and told everyone there not to say anything. And that has contributed to the ambiguity as to whether the fight happened or not, because even people who were there were kind of told not to talk about it. Now, all of this sounds very fantastical. And look, is this true? All right. Can I tell you this is exactly the way it happened? Absolutely not. No one can. I just know that, you know, from the person who told me and then also that Leo Chi Kang, who had no reason to lie to me, said he was there, mm. that it's plausible that a fight did occur and it ended up very quickly and perhaps not on the uh, Lao Tai Chun side. Mm. All right. So like, the, but anyway, <laughs> but these are things that I still want to find out. Right. Mm. And so, you know, if, if I can finally get this answer, that would be, uh, that would be amazing. And at the time that Bruce Lee died, they actually interviewed Lao Tai Chun for um, about Bruce Lee's death. And he was very like respectful and talking about what a tragedy it was that he died so young. And he was, I mean, obviously, it's doubtful that he would have been boastful anyway, you know, because it's not a okay. Chi the Chinese are not like that, you know. But it's interesting that they interviewed him at that time. And he mm -hmm. was very, you know, he was very respectful about Bruce Lee and, and didn't have, you know, anything weird, any crosswords to say um, about Bruce Lee. Okay. So, so that is what I know about Lao Tai Chun, right? And so he mentions him in this phone conversation, right? And the, the last Lao Tai Chun story, which I also cannot confirm. So again, when we tell these stories, it's like, you know, these are things that were told to me by people that I respect, but you know, they may have told it to me with absolute confidence, but they may also be wrong. Okay. Mm. So again, you know, uh, um, I, I'm not making any claims about this kind of stuff. All right. 
the actor Lam Cheng Ying, which many Wing Chun people know from the movie Prodigal Son. He played yes. he played uh, Leung Yi Tai, the master without the eyebrows. He's right? real cool with Bruce Lee. He was amazing, right? And Lam Cheng Ying was a great actor, and in my opinion, quite underrated because he was extremely. If you want to see his range as an actor, you should watch the movie Painted Faces, because there he's not just in a martial arts role; he's actually in a dramatic role, and mm -hmm. he's amazing. And as an acrobatic actor, you see him in Prodigal Son, yeah. and he was unbelievable. Killing it. And you know, Mr. Vampire, and just so many movies. But he I've was never seen that one. he was oftentimes a bit of a character actor and a bit of a second fiddle, except for in the Mr. Vampire films. And he was amazing. And I was a huge Lam Ching Ying fan. And when he passed away in the late '90s, uh, I, I I cried because I, I mm. love Lam Ching Ying. Like it was very devastating when I found out that he passed away. Um, he was on. Uh, big Boss. He was a very young stuntman at that time. And Bruce really had a, a fondness for Lam Ching Ying. And Lam Ching Ying was part of Bruce Lee's entourage. Yes. You know, and, and he used Same. Lam Ching Ying a lot. And Lam Ching Ying did the stunts for Han, uh, for Sek Kin in Enter the Dragon. <laughs> yeah. Because there were some hard falls that he had to take. And the old uh, oh, Sek Kin is not going to do that. Those were, it was all Lam Ching Ying. And Lam Ching Ying is in, pro in uh, Enter the Dragon. You see you see him pop up like in background. Sometimes yeah. he's like the guy in the, uh, in the white suit. Sometimes he's a guy in a yellow suit. And you see him like kind of pop in. I need you to point here. those out to me. Absolutely. All oh, right, right. So uh, Lam Ting Ying, amazing, right? Lam Ting Ying, from what I understood, he's a very easygoing, peace-loving guy. Not not an aggressive guy. Trained by um, Madame Fan Fok Fao, from, which was the competing opera troupe to the one that Jackie Chan and company went to. She He learned from a female. And so that's why he was also very adept at playing the female roles. Mm -hmm. and, and so there were kind of like two big opera schools, the, the Jim Yoon one and the uh, Madame Fan Fok Fa one. There were the, like a lot of the Hong Kong stuntmen came or stunt women came from either one of those two camps, right? And uh, so that's why they always got work as uh, uh, stunt people because they could do all the flips and tumbles and they could do choreography very easily. So anyway, Bruce Lee really liked him. And there's a story and there's a, a, a video on YouTube that talks about this that uh, Lam Cheng Ying and Bruce Lee were in a restaurant in Hong Kong. And Lao Tai Chun happened to be in that restaurant. And this is at the time when Lao Tai Chun is talking all this ish in the papers. But apparently oh. they had not yet fought whether they actually ended up fighting or not. And Lam Cheng Ying sees Lao Tai Chun and gets very shaken and upset. because uh, And supposedly Lam Cheng Ying, from what I heard, called Bruce Lee Sifu, not because he was learning martial arts from him, but he so respected him. Normally in that kind of relationship, Lam, Lam Jing Ying might call Bruce Lee like older brother. Not Si Hing like Kung Fu brother, but like mm. like actual brother. I like got Gao, you. Gao, Gao or something like that. Or Gao or so, some kind of like, uh, you know, uh, Long Gao, like brother, bro, brother dragon or something. Mm. He would normally call him that, but he called him Sifu from what I heard, which just showed like another level of respect that he really respected Bruce Lee in that kind of way. And the story was that Lam Jing Ying was so like Bruce was kind of waving it off like hey kind of like in that phone conversation if that guy wants to come and try to slap me in the face let him do it and then that'll be the end of him mm -hmm. but until he does it cares right Lam Ching Ying gets up and walks over to Lao Tai Chun's table and in like you know <laughs> in an expletive laden what? rant tells him in the Chinese equivalent of you, you are not effing qualified to challenge my Sifu and if you want to fight you can just fight me right now and Lao Tai Chun, you know, you can imagine, yeah, you have been to Hong Kong, what kind of stir this would cause if something like that happened in the middle of, and you know, everyone's having yum cha, and you know how Chinese people are, they would all just stop and stare. <laughs> <laughs> they would keep eating and they would keep looking, right? Oh, like, wow. what's going on over here? And that was it. So that is another story, right? And unfortunately, Lam Ching Ying is not around to confirm or deny, or the, what I understand from his character, probably, even yeah. if you had asked him this story, he probably wouldn't have said anything. So, so anyway... We have just got through the first five minutes of the phone conversation, all right? <laughs> so I, I, I expect okay. there's going to be an anthology series of this 20-minute yeah. phone conversation uh, before we get through all of it. So probably a really good place to, to Only end. Only five minutes. Uh, yeah, only five only minutes five out of twenty minutes. minutes. We so we did two. So we two did. Episodes. Yeah. So we did two episodes out of five. So yeah, you you can do the math. It's it's All gonna right. take it's gonna take us a few parts to get through the whole thing. So um, yeah. So what what do you think about that? I freaking love this. I um, man. So I'm assuming that the fight had to happen after this conversation. Yes. So this phone conversation is very early on. Mm. And again, early, we're talking about a two and a half year time span. Yeah. So when I say early, this is after Big Boss and before yeah. Fist of Fury came out. 
Wow. So this would still be, I think, before Lao, Lao Tai Chun is just starting to kind of, yeah. you know, open his mouth in the press Ooh. and stuff. So, so yeah. Timeline-wise, I don't know. I mean, I'm really going to try to nail this at some mm -hmm. point, right? And hopefully I can get a real yeah. solid answer. Yeah, you listeners definitely chime in if you have some info on that. I don't that. think anyone has any info on that. <laughs> <laughs> but Lao Tai Chun, if you're out there, Lao Tai yeah. Chun disappeared off the face of the earth in 1974. So I don't know if he's still alive. I don't know if he's still around. But um, his IMDb just stopped. His <clears throat> last movie was The Chinese Tiger in 1974, and he played Mr. Chow. All right. Yes. And that was it. I got to see. So, uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, I All guess right. that's it for today. So, hey. Well, thank you, Sifu. I think on the next episode, we're going to have to continue with our tournament series because we still got a lot to talk yeah. about there. So, we'll see. We'll talk about oh, that then. Oh, man. Awesome. Tong Sun. Yeah, Tong Sun. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, that was today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius. What did you guys think of today's episode? Chime in below in the comments. Do you think the fight between Bruce Lee and Lao Tai Chun really happened? And if so or not, how do you know? I look forward to seeing your responses. All right, and before we leave today, I just want to let you guys know that I have a special offer for Kung Fu Genius Podcast listeners. My new book, The 15 Chi Sao Fundamentals, is going on pre-order right now. And as a fan of the Kung Fu Genius Podcast, you can use the code KFG sign to get a signed copy of the book on pre-order. The pre-order has already started, so you can order the book now. They should be in at the end of March that's 2021, and we will ship out as soon as they come in. And if previous sales are any indication, the whole first run will be sold out before they come in. So get your 15 Chi Sao Fundamentals today and use the code KFG sign to get a signed copy from yours truly. And I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a kung fu genius Technique speaks for me, not lineage Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Si Kung And I produce masters You surpassed us, your kung fu stiffer than corpse and caskets City Wing Chung is the house I built Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt Alex Richter, always the- He <laughs> watches this, why are you doing that? All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius The genius we'll be discussing will continue to discuss. We'll continue discussing. That's <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will continue discussing the lost tribes of Shabazz. <laughs> wow. I had the wrong idea about what this podcast was about. That is a tongue twister. Sorry. I don't write these things. Ew. Oh, wait, I do. <laughs> All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Gene. What? <laughs> Yo! I didn't I do saw anything. your mouth moving. My mouth wasn't moving. Yeah. Oh, I saw his mouth moving out the corner of my eye. Yeah. Am I tripping? Yeah. You are straight tripping. Like you got your Nina, and then you know I'm straight tripping. <laughs> All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will continue discussing the secret phone conversation of Bruce Lee and Daniel Lee. Lots of gems. No, it's not. There's lots of other stuff. Oh, you were so lots close. Lots of insight. So close. Lots of context. Next. D -d -d -d. Lots of Bruce Lee. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. All right, peeps. On today's episode of the company. <laughs> hey, man. All right. <laughs> Please stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to erase that from my huh? brain. Erase I don't know what you're talking about. Events. All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will continue discussing... My guy? My guy! <laughs> <laughs> Bringing up past bloopers. The lost episode of the Bruce Lee recording video on tapes and phones. Bruce Lee phone conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce Lee phone conversation. I had to cough the whole time yeah, I was holding it in. The secret. All right, peeps, on today's. <laughs> I keep seeing ass! <laughs> Continue discussing the. Language! Language! Jeez! Oh, this God. is a PG podcast. Man. Secretly recorded, secretly recorded, secretly recorded phone conversation. Lots of intaxel, sackle, 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 lots of insight. Oh.
Oh. Lots of insight, lots of context. Hold on. We can have you do it word by word, it. and I'll just string them together. <laughs> <laughs> on today's episode <laughs> of the Kung Fu Genius. <laughs> Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? How's everything? <laughs> Yeah, They're not cool. supposed yeah. to be any bloopers in the episode, all right? All right, let's try it one more time. Right. Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? I'm good, Sifu. How are yeah. you? <laughs> all right, guys. Well, I hope you liked today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius. Please chime in in the YouTube comments below. Let me know what you thought about today's episode. And do you think the brute, 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 I got a case of the Dre's. <laughs> that is a fucking professional right there. I heard a click.